This week on the Bioneers, Revolution from the Heart of Nature. And in my faith tradition and in most faith traditions, we come to realize we are one body. We're in this together. And if we're in this together, then that means if we each do our part, it all gets done. Sister Simone Campbell and the nuns on the bus. It's Spirit in Action, this week on the Bioneers. Support for the Bioneers Revolution from the Heart of Nature is provided in part by Organic Valley Family of Farms, funding also provided by a grant from the Park Foundation, and by the generous support of listeners like you. As 2015 hurtled toward becoming the hottest year on Earth in human history since record-keeping began, Pope Francis tossed a Hail Mary pass into the escalating political battle over global warming. His climate encyclical went where angels fear to tread. In the spirit of St. Francis of Assisi, the Catholic patron saint of animals and nature, the spiritual leader of the world's one billion Catholics sanctified our kinship with all creation. He called upon humanity to embrace our brothers and sisters of the natural world. Pope Francis linked the twin crises of inequality and human-induced climate disruption with capitalism itself. Watching the rich get richer than ever, he denounced the deified market and the new colonialism of government austerity policies. He called out the Global North's ecological debt to the Global South, acknowledging how the Global South suffers first and worst from environmental exploitation the North created and profits from. Quoting a fourth century bishop, he branded the unfettered pursuit of money as the dung of the devil. Pope Francis expanded upon the liberation theology movement that originally sprung from his native Latin American soil to address poverty and inequality. He began to fashion what might be called liberation ecology, breaking the shackles of greed and economic inequality that drive environmental destruction. His words landed as a balm for the soul of one group in particular, progressive nuns who have long held that same vision. This is Spirit in Action, Three Virtues for the 21st Century with Sister Simone Campbell. My name is Neil Harvey. I'll be your host. Welcome to the Bioneers, Revolution from the Heart of Nature. Our nation and our world is based in community. And we have lost sight of that story. Sister Simone Campbell is one of the most renowned and influential figures in contemporary faith-based progressive activism. She's executive director of Network, a social justice nonprofit founded by Catholic sisters in the 1970s that advocates on Capitol Hill. She spoke at a Bioneers conference. Back in the 80s, the story of our nation began to change. And President Reagan is at the heart of that change, where he said, we're all about the individual. We are about the one who rode off on the horse into the West and settled the West, as if that was done by one man. And as a woman, I will say it was a man. That's not a gender generic statement. The man rode off and settled the West. But what we know is it's an unpatriotic lie to say we're based in individualism. The fact is we're based in community. It was not one wagon heading West. It was not, I mean, if you yelled circle the wagons to your one wagon, you kind of had trouble. <laughs> it was also the fact that if you did a barn raising and only one person showed up, <laughs> it's a little difficult. And what I have learned is what builds community is when we let our hearts be broken open by hearing the stories. It is, it is risking the pain of a broken heart not the organization of the cerebellum that makes it all organized. That's a defense against making progress. 
Because as long as it's just here in my head, I'm in control, I can take care of it, don't worry, I don't need anybody else. But when my heart's broken, open, I know I need everyone. Sister Simone Campbell's heart has been broken on a daily basis, along with tens of thousands of other Catholic sisters responsible for running many U.S. hospital systems and free clinics. They routinely witness the systematic denial of health care to the poor and to women and children. Sister Simone had joined the Sisters of Social Service in 1964. She went on to become a lawyer and in 1978 founded the Community Law Center in Oakland, California. She served for the next 18 years as its lead attorney, practicing family law and working on the needs of the working poor. In 2004, she became executive director of Network and in 2010 worked for the passage of President Obama's Affordable Care Act. She wrote the nun's letter supporting the reform. It caused a ruckus. I wrote what's called the nun's letter, which helped the Affordable Care Act get passed. And I got kissed by President Obama right there and thank. I didn't wash my face for a very long time. But because of it, we took a position that was different than the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. Hmm. And, and yeah, bravo. <laughs> but 59 leaders of Catholic sisters signed the letter. Hmm. And one of the uh, sisters said, because the bishops were really upset, she said, oh, the girls played the boys, and for once the girls won. <laughs> but what happened as a result of it, though, was the Vatican uh, was upset, and mm -hmm. so they censured the Catholic sisters in the United States. You might have heard a little bit about that unpleasantness. Well, it's all over now. Pope Francis said, be nice, make up. And, um, but what they did was they named our organization as being a bad influence on Catholic sisters in the United States because we work too much for the people in poverty. <laughs> Since that's our mission, it was like, oh, I think that's a badge of honor. Thank you very much. That moment of notoriety offered Sister Simone and her colleagues the opportunity to further Network's mission by launching the Nuns on the Bus Tour in 2012. They set out to challenge conservatives in Congress who wanted to continue to drastically cut the budgets of programs that have been helping the poorest Americans since the mid-1960s. Sister Simone Campbell spoke with us at a Bioneers conference. President Johnson's vision was of the great society where everyone could get ahead. Coming from poor family sharecroppers, he said that we had to address the issues of hunger, education, and this comprehensive approach to addressing poverty in our nation. And so the war on poverty was about creating programs at the local level, funded by the federal government, that then people could take responsibility for their neighborhoods, get some federal money, and make a difference in their community. And these community action programs have done some amazing things with entrepreneurial activity, providing child care. I've talked to a number of the groups around the country, and these are the most innovative folks. But what's happened over time is their money has been cut and cut and cut and cut. And so rather than really investing in the community, it's been like dribs and drabs and unpredictable. Then there are the programs like food stamps that we now call SNAP, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, and AIDS to Families with Dependent Children was the monetary way of getting money to families. And that got changed in the Clinton era with welfare reform. And so now what we have is that these very same programs that were meant for those who had fallen on hard times, who were without employment, these programs now have become basically business subsidies because low-wage workers don't have enough to support their families and they're living in poverty. I, I mean, we broke the promise that if you worked hard, played by the rules, that you could support your family. That's the American way. But we've broken that promise. And so now you could work hard, play by the rules, and not be able to support your family. So what you have to do is to use safety net programs. You have to use food stamps. You have to use Medicaid. You have to use all these other programs so your family can survive. We always look at the person who receives these programs. This is part of the problem politically. So they blame the person. Well, the person isn't working hard enough. Working full-time, probably two jobs, and they're not working hard enough? Give me a break. 
Sister Simone Campbell advocated against the conservative budget, written by Republican Congressman Paul Ryan. This time, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops agreed, stating that the proposed budget failed a basic moral test. Sister Simone worked with a Washington interfaith community to create what they called a faithful budget. And the faithful budget has at its core this idea that budget policy can change income and wealth disparity. Tax policy is at the heart of this. And so we say what we need is reasonable revenue for responsible programs. Responsible programs are those that are audited and accounted for and are providing good service. And ironically, social service programs, we believe, are the standard for auditing and that the military should be as audited as social service programs. But there has never been an audit of the Pentagon. Not that I have any feelings on the subject, but if you want waste, fraud, and abuse, which are the catchwords in D.C., that's where we ought to look, especially in procurement, the way they buy stuff. A new aircraft carrier is supposed to cost $13 billion. I mean, it's just ridiculous, just ridiculous. But, oh, dear, I guess we'll just have to give them the money. If we did away with the, that one aircraft carrier and just gave the money to all these amazing social service programs, we could address our issues. It would be easy to take care of. We would feed our people, take care of their health care, but we'll never say that it's an aircraft carrier that's our problem. We'll always blame our people. I don't understand that. So anyway, our faithful budget is an effort to say that if we're faithful together, then we care for our people first that we need to increase taxes on some. Hedge fund, you know, all those guys that trade on Wall Street and make a billion dollars, they found out a way to get not salary, but to get income and dividends only from the sale of the stocks and bonds. Mm -hmm. So that only gets taxed at 15% rate. So rather than 20 or 30%, which the rest of us pay, they're, they're paying less taxes than we are. That's wrong, this is wrong. But we try to do it, and oh, brother, oh, you're going to depress the market. No, no, you're just going to depress the guys that trade in the market. That's all. So we, we try to advocate for the folks that are left out. Since 2012, the nuns on the bus have traveled throughout the country, visiting communities and inviting people to share their stories. One stop was Ferguson, Missouri the now infamous town outside St. Louis where a white police officer shot and killed Michael Brown, an unarmed African-American teenager. Sister Simone bore witness with a group of mothers who were trying to bridge the deep racial divide. And these moms came up with the idea that maybe if they went to talk to white moms about what black moms have to worry about, that white moms don't have to worry about, maybe the toxicity of racism could be alleviated. What these moms told me, I, I mean, I'll never forget Marlo. Marlo's a, a big, tall, wonderful, gorgeous African-American woman with this shocking white hair. It's just beautiful, and she's a grandma. Her grandson, Chico, Chico, you could rub his head and pat him on the shoulder, and he was just this cute little kid. And she told us that, Within about an eight-month period, Chico went from being four-foot something where you could pat him on the head to over six feet. But what she said that terrifies her is still inside of Chico. He feels like the four-foot eight little kid. He has no idea of how other people see him because of the toxicity of racism. His walking threatens some people. And I realized... I walk in white skin, and I don't even have to worry about that. I don't have to worry that I might be intimidating. I, as a woman, I am less intimidating than just some tall, big men. And I realized I have a responsibility to let my heart be broken open by Chico and Marlo's story and say, enough, enough. Yeah. Amy who teaches in a university, and she has a PhD, fancy letters after her name, I forget all of them, and she said she's got two boys, an eighth grader and a 10th grader, and she drills them regularly on what to do when they're stopped by the police, not if, when, and she says you keep your hands out of your pockets, you keep your arms away from your body, you don't get any teenage attitude 
and you say, yes, sir, no, sir. <sighs> Can you imagine teenagers not getting teenage attitude if they're stopped by the police? Well, she's terrified. She's terrified. I'm trying to teach them humility, she says. And then her eighth grader said to her the week before we came, Mommy, and when she said Mommy, I, that somehow broke my heart. Mommy, how long is this going to go on? And she had to look him in the eye and say, the rest of your life, the rest of your life. Amy's story about her teenage sons has profoundly affected Sister Simone. I mean, it's such a powerful story. It just broke my heart. She said that her 10th grader thought that by dressing preppy, he could be protected. And she said, as if clothes could protect him from bullets. Who are we as a nation that that's the truth for our children? So anyway, I, I've become a passionate, passionate missionary for us walking in this white skin of privilege to wake up to this fear and divisiveness that we carry around that we don't even know. And I know I walk in white privilege. You know, you say that easily, blah, blah, blah. but then you meet it up close and personal. Whew. Things that I, I didn't know. You know, a lot of my passion for justice got fueled around the civil rights reality in, you know, late 60s, early 70s. On the same bus trip, we were in Memphis and got to go to the Civil Rights Museum there where Dr. King was killed. And I realized, really, our engagement with civil rights really did die with his death in so many ways. And that loss for our nation was like we've been slipping back ever since in our awareness. And it helped nourish my commitment to being more bold in talking about it. We've got to address it. When the nuns on the bus launched their listening tour in 2012, they hoped to draw attention to their work on poverty, racism, and social issues, and to somehow stop even further cuts in aid to those in greatest need. The theme for their 2015 tour was Bridge the Divides, Transform Politics. And I had realized in the image of bridging divides is that you start making a bridge by sinking pillars way down deep. And you think when you see just the pillars, how are they ever going to get it together? But what happens is over time, you can build out and meet in the middle. We started in the shadow of the arch in St. Louis, in front of the courthouse where the Dred Scott decision was made. And remember, that decision was the one that solidified racism in our nation by affirming slavery. It was in the shadow of the anguish of our past, but this gateway to the West of our future that we started our bus trip. It was at that very opening that I heard from moms. There are these two moms that have gone together. They live in an area just outside St. Louis where there's a Superfund cleanup site left over from World War II creation of the atomic bomb. What the moms told me is their kids have developed brain tumors because there are radioactive waste that was just covered up after World War II. Now, that's longer ago than I've been alive, and you would think we would figure out how to clean it up. But currently, there's a huge fight about who's supposed to clean it up. And now there is an underground fire that has started that is moving towards the Missouri River. You would think our people would wake up, don't you? That maybe we ought to pay a little bit attention. But the economic powers are such that they're worried about the cost. When these two moms are worried because both of their kids have been diagnosed with brain tumors that are the result of the toxicity in the area. And they told me that there is over a 300% increase in brain tumors in young kids. How in God's green earth can we continue to destroy our planet and worry about the money involved in a cleanup when our children are dying. This is wrong. 
And these, these brave moms, these brave moms who worry about their kids and chemo and surgery and things that just sounded so horrible, and these kids who are losing their childhood because they spend most of their time in the hospital getting chemo or radiation, these kids, these moms broke my heart. I cannot stay silent when my heart is broken because I have opportunities. We all have opportunities to share their story and say, come on, we're better than this. Our nation is better than this. Our world is better than this. Sister Simone is deeply inspired by Pope Francis. With climate disruption as the centerpiece of his encyclical, he declared that its harmful effects on the earth, as well as on poor communities around the world, constituted a moral issue we must all address. Sister Simone believes the Pope's bold statements have helped highlight the inextricable connection between environmental destruction and social injustice. And because he sees this intersection of earth and the economy and how we treat each other, it's all one. And he says what we have to change is the culture of exploitation. Exploiting the earth, exploiting each other, we have to stop it. And so his holistic view I find so fantastic because he speaks with a candor that is refreshing from the inside out. It's from what matters most. And I think he comes from a deeply spiritual place. I call it a, a contemplative stance where you trust the words that are given. So the words that are given in this moment are the words to be said. I recognize it because it's kind of how I try to do it. What I advocate is figure out where is your call and act on it. Share the vision for who we want to be. And that vision includes a whole earth where all can live in dignity with food, shelter, and clothing enough to survive in their families. It requires all of us to make that vision happen. To help make that vision a reality, Sister Simone Campbell offers three virtues for the 21st century. The first is holy curiosity. Holy curiosity that gets you to talk to people you wouldn't talk to otherwise, even folks like my brother Jim, who drives me nuts, um, who can answer the question, what are you caring about? How do you think about what's happening in our world? So if you ask those kinds of questions, just standing in the line in the grocery store, that's where I do it, grocery store missionary work, and maybe, it, but if we're curious, if we're curious about others, then we get to create community in that moment. People are hungry for these conversations I've experienced. The second virtue is sacred gossip. <laughs> sacred gossip where you share what you've heard. So I, uh, the other night I was out at a diner over in Walnut Creek, and uh, my holy curiosity leads me to ask waitstaff, are you making a living wage? Or, or are you relying just on tips? But if we share the truth about what we find out, then we can begin to create connections. And then finally, the third virtue is in reflection, in the quiet of listening to your inside self, figure out what your one passion is, your one mission, your one piece of what to do. Because it's from that place of reflection, of weeping for the broken heart, of knowing that if your heart's been broken open, you're going to be called forward. And in my faith tradition and in most faith traditions, we come to realize we are one body. We're in this together. And if we're in this together, then that means if we each do our part, it all gets done. Sister Simone Campbell, Spirit in Action, Three Virtues, for the 21st century. You can see and hear more from Sister Simone Campbell 
and explore more Bioneers radio programs, podcasts, and videos online at Bioneers.org. For information on attending the National Bioneers Conference and Bioneers events in your area, please visit Bioneers.org or call 1-877-BIONEER. The Bioneers, Revolution from the Heart of Nature is a production of Bioneers and Collective Heritage Institute. Executive producer, Kenny Ossibel. Written by Kenny Ossibel. Senior producer and station relations, Stephanie Welch. Host and consulting producer, Neil Harvey. Program engineer, Emily Harris. Production assistants, Tina Rubio and Melanie Choi. Interview recording engineer, Emily Harris. Our theme music is co-written by the Baca Forest people of Cameroon and Baca Beyond from the album East to West. All royalties from Baca compositions and performances go to the Baca Forest people through the charity Global Music Exchange. Find out more at globalmusicexchange.org. Additional music was made available by Jamie Sieber at jamiesieber.com. The opinions expressed in the Bioneers, Revolution from the Heart of Nature, are those of the presenters and are not necessarily those of Bioneers and Collective Heritage Institute, the underwriters, or this radio station. My name is Neil Harvey. Thank you for listening. I invite you to join the Bioneers in inspiring a shift to live on Earth in ways that honor the web of life, each other, and future generations. This is program number 0416. This program was made possible in part by Organic Valley's pasture-raised organic dairy products, bringing the good from our family farmers to your table at organicvalley.coop. Funding also provided by a grant from the Park Foundation, dedicated to heightening public awareness of critical issues, and by the generous support of listeners like you. If you love Bioneers Radio, it's free and easy to support us. Just take a moment to post a review on our podcast on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you find our show online. You'll be helping other people find and enjoy these incredible thinkers and storytellers. And thank you for helping us out.